Hey guys, first off, R.I.P. David Murphy. <laughs> of course. That's a course. Tough, tough one for a Baylor guy. Um, at least you signed Sean Tolson, so we're all good. We, we filled our quota. Uh, I know I have, a, I, I have something I'm sure it's on the mind of a lot of people here tonight. Uh, pretty important. Um, Wednesday night is dollar hot dog night. And we lost Nolan Ryan this year, so what are we going to do? Thank you. Those hot dogs are going to taste like crap. Now stretch. You know, I talked to some of the guys at Valley Ranch, Randy, and they tell me that Romo's got to throw that out ball better. Thank you, stretch. Shut up, Mosley. Back to you, Jamie. No, no, he doesn't. He doesn't. Um, look. I would have been happier if everything was copacetic and they could have worked it out and no one wanted to be here and everybody wanted no one to be here. No one wanted to see that thing break up. If it was unworkable, and I'm not sure it was unworkable, but if it was at the point where a change had to be made, I think most of us would probably agree. Uh, I don't know everybody in the room. I'm pretty sure ownership agreed. Their wagon was hitched to JD and AJ and Thad and Don Welke and Josh Boyd and his whole crew and everybody that he's built throughout the minor league system to develop these players and scout them before they get to the minor leagues, you couldn't afford to jettison that group off just because you've got Tom Landry, you know, down the hall. And, and again, it's – nobody's better off without Nolan Ryan around, but, if it, again, if it was unworkable, the franchise is in better shape with J.D. and his group still here if no one decided that he couldn't continue to work at the, under the whatever job title and job description he was given. Go ahead, sir. All right, so Amber wants to know, Russell Wilson, what's the, uh, what's the attraction, what's, uh, what's his role going forward? Uh, what J.D. said, and I actually do believe him this time. I usually... <laughs> He said that what they essentially did was they spent $12,000, which is what it cost to take someone in the minor league phase of the Rule 5 draft. It is nothing, obviously, in baseball. They spent $12,000 for a motivational speaker. They want Russell Wilson to come in spring training between football seasons and talk to the minor leaguers, who obviously, you know, a fifth of them are going to have him on their fantasy football team, so they're going to look up to the guy. I mean, seriously, they're going to they're going to see Russell Wilson talking to them, and they're going to be it's going to be like us listening to Nolan Ryan, and he's going to talk to them about the things that JD talked about. They see in Wilson the work ethic, the character, professionalism, all those things that they want to instill in their young players. They want Russell Wilson to come out even if it's one time and talk to the group, and they will feel like that was a worthwhile twelve thousand dollar investment if it changed one kid out there to start to grind it when he wasn't before and turns into the player that he can be. Now, Wilson came back later that day and told the Seattle press, screw that, I'm coming out, I'm taking ground balls, I'm taking BP, I can't wait for this. I mean, just for people that don't know, he spent two years in the Rockies system. I mean, he's, this is not a complete, you know, farce of a pick. I mean, he's never going to play pro baseball again, but he did. So he's actually got some chops, and they want to give him a chance to come just spend a day or more if he wants in surprise and, and see if his, you know, the, uh, the qualities he has off the field in his sport can rub off a little bit on their young players. Is there a chance that he'll actually come out and do something? I mean, play, go play for Frisco, anything I, like you know, that? I, I don't, I don't see the Rangers as this type of organization, but I guess I could see there's a 1% chance he could make a Garth Brooks appearance in a spring training game. Yeah. You know, yeah. what's that? I'm saying there's a chance. I, <laughs> I don't think the Seahawks would be real happy about that if he did. Pulls a hamstring, legging out a double, and, and he's, you know, he's going to be late for training camp as a result. So I, I doubt we'll see him suited up other than on the backfields you know, holding a fungo bat and, and dragging his glove out there for a little bit. You know, one of my favorite parts about that story is J.D. came on our show and he was talking about when he talked to Russell Wilson, he said, man, I called him and it was like, you know, I don't know, 7 in the morning or something real early in the morning. 
and he answered his phone and he was lifting weights. And JD was legitimately impressed by that. And I thought, who knows if he was really lifting weights? Shouldn't we all just say that if anybody calls you? It's like, oh, hold on a second, 99, 100. I'm sorry, what do you got? I mean, maybe he was, maybe he wasn't lifting weights. But if any of you ever call me, I will be lifting weights. Go ahead, sir. Uh, on uh, Groove's behalf, uh, what's it going to take for the Rangers to go get Brandon Inge this offseason? Oh. Yeah. Probably too much. It'd probably take too much. I, you know. Is he still is he still playing? Did he get a job? Has he got a job this winter? Well, I'm just saying, if he isn't, if, if he isn't, then maybe there's a chance. But I'm I'm sorry, it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> yes, we need a third baseman. All right, sir, what do you got? Uh, my question is uh, about the starting rotation. How do you see it shaping up? We've got a couple of Harrison Lewis coming back. Had a couple of kids come up last year. Seems like we. We're awfully deep at starting pitching. What do you think our rotation will look like going into opening day? Well, if they don't make another move, you know, they're hoping it's Darvish, and then there's Holland and Harrison, assuming Harrison is healthy and he's saying that he's on track. And then you, you know, Colby Lewis, will he be ready to start the season or not? We don't know. Alexio Gondo, is he a reliever or a starter? may depend on the rest. But Martin Perez, I think, has established himself now where he's a fixture in the rotation, and it's a, he's got a job to lose. So you've got six guys right there that hedges a little bit against Harrison and Lewis not being ready. There were rumors they were in on Sean Markham, who signed today with, I want to say, the Indians. Someone else signed him to a, a you know, I, I don't even know if it was a minor league deal or a cheap yeah, minor, deal. minor league deal. So I would be, I would not be surprised if the Rangers do add another veteran starter who's sort of on the back end of a career or coming off an injury to a non-roster deal, a make-good type thing where he could – you know, open some eyes. They did that a couple of years ago, like with Brett Tomko. He ended up making a few starts, then getting released. But you know, sometimes you can catch lightning in the bottle that way. And I would, I would expect there will be another guy brought in on a non-roster deal like that. But I don't think they ever stop looking around for that opportunity to get the one or two. And if David Price is really put on the market this winter, and maybe he already has been, and maybe they're already in discussions, and they just haven't found a meeting point, or you know, Tampa Bay as is their right, is probably asking for twice as much as they should get because there's enough teams that, you know, will duke it out and maybe someone will actually give it up. So I, even though I think they probably have a set five and a half right now, they're always looking for that guy that pushes everybody else down a spot. If they, uh, if they do add another one, who do you see them trying to move? Lewis? Harrison? You can't really move Lewis, you know, at the stage of his career coming off injury. I don't really think you can move Harrison unless you move him for 20 cents on the dollar because he's coming off a of surgery and you don't want to you don't want to sell him low. Um, the guy that would pro well, it would either be Holland or Ogando. And if Ogando, I think the decision would be do we want him in the bullpen as a potential weapon or is there enough of a market for him where you can pair him maybe with a prospect and go get that big bat? Holland could probably get you the big bat. Um, you know, there's always been rumors that Toronto was interested in Holland. You could go talk to them about Encarnacion, maybe Bautista, if they would listen hard enough. But if you decided that you had an excess, Holland is probably the guy you could get the most for Ogando next after that. I appreciate it. You know, speaking of Holland and, and trade rumors uh, and the way this stuff works, we were com coming on the air one day. It was right at two, right when we were starting the show, and Skin gets this text. And he's like, oh, my God, are you hearing this rumor of Holland to the Dodgers for Kemp? You, were, you called me about this. And uh, you were actually the first thing that brought my radar up because we're like, wow, okay, so Skin is getting a heads up that uh, I guess somebody saw on ESPN, uh, you know, there's discussions about Holland and Kemp being in this deal. And we just kind of talked about it. Jamie's like, where are you seeing this uh, deal? And I was like, Skin, where are you seeing this deal? And he's like, oh, I just got a text from my buddy who saw it on Sports Center, and I was like, what? Your buddy saw it? And then I noticed you, you called when after I talked to you, it wasn't in Trot Coffee, well played by you. <laughs> and, and so I was like, Skin, call your buddy, see what the hell he was drinking. I can't find it on the internet anywhere, but we had already talked about it on the air. And I get this text from Holland, who's listening with his dad. <laughs> He's like, hey, call me ASAP. I call him during a commercial break. He goes, what's this rumor about me going to the Dodgers? I'm here with my dad. I was like, damn it, Skin. Who is this? Skin? This guy, that's just a slight humble brag for you. Um, all right. 
Go ahead, oh. sir. Yeah. Um, okay. During last year, we had a bunch of injuries up in the rotation, and at some point you had Ross Wolf starting games. How many guys do you, need, do you want to have in the rotation on March 31st in front of Nick Tepish so that nobody behind Nick Tepish has to pitch in the start a major league game? You could say that for 30 teams. I mean, I mean, seriously, you would like to have seven or eight guys that are capable, but there just aren't that many around that, that you can depend on. I think they, they have to feel pretty good that they got a couple starts out of Ross Wolf that kept them in games or won games. I mean, that guy was going into the season, he was, what, 28 on the depth chart? I mean, and the, the fact that he even got to the big leagues is crazy, and then he pitched well a couple times. Nick Tepish is a guy that, you know, he had bumps in the road, but there was a, there was a stretch. Wasn't he rookie of the month in April for the, in the entire American League? I mean, there's something there. Uh, again, he's not a guy that you want to go into the season saying, we need him to make the team. Um, but there's, there are teams that would like to have Nick Tepish in AAA. I guarantee you that because he's, he's proven that – you know, when he's right, he can get big league hitters out. And not every team's got that in their AAA rotation. All right. Sir, what do you Shout got? out, by the way, to Dan Mealy. So I can buy myself a month of not getting bugged by him for not shouting out to him. <laughs> Dan Mealy, everybody. He's a great man. And an incredible pitcher in a parent pitch. I've seen him. He's right down the middle every time. That's hard to do. Well done. There you go. There you go. And a great dad and a great coach. Go ahead, sir. Hey, thanks a lot. Uh, first time, long time. And uh, I, just, I just wanted to say, if Sin Chu Chu, if he doesn't get signed, hypothetically speaking, what type of deal is they looking for if they go after Cruz? And what type of, uh, how, are the, how are the Rangers fans going to look at him when he comes back? Open arms or iffy or, you know, hey. shit. I'll hang up and listen. I'll hang up and listen. I, 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 think, I think the fans would be okay with Cruz. I don't think it's going to be like Lance Berkman coming back. Um, uh, but it's not going to be Mike Napoli either. It's not like, oh, my God, we need Nelson Cruz back. He, obviously, he's had some huge moments for this team, and I think people, at least I do, I remember the good, the good times of Nelson Cruz. And, you know, if he did not get suspended for those 50 games last year, he was on his way to his best season. Um, I think they would probably give him two years and an option, and right now he's not anywhere ready, near ready to take that. He wants, he wants four years, and probably I think someone's reported that he would take three to stay here. And I just don't think Texas – he's 33, 33 years old. Um, he's a very late bloomer. Uh, it took him a long time to get to the big leagues, and it's, you know, unfortunately for him – the first time he has reached free agency in his career, he's on the back end of his career. So this is his one chance to land that multi-year deal, set up generations for life, and he's going to get it. He's going to get 30 to 50 million from somebody. You know, um, I just don't think it's going to be here unless he's willing to accept some of the risk of that third season. And I don't think he's going to have to do that unless other teams continue to back out on him and, and go elsewhere. I think the, you know, the money that we're talking about for Nelson Cruz just kind of shows Prince Fielder at 7 and 138 is such a bargain. You know, we were kicking her one day, we were talking on the show, Skin wanted to pay uh, Nelly Cruz three years, 45 mil, just because the uh, you know, power is in such short supply. And we ran it up the flagpole, and what we were hearing back from people is that the Rangers would be laughed off the phone by Nelly's people if they wanted three years and 45 million. Now, a lot's changed in the market since then, and that kind of – you know, when you wait it out, maybe those prices come back down to earth, which is kind of what the Prince Fielder original deal was. They were kind of, we're waiting it out, we're waiting it out, but it only takes one team to come in and blow it up. You know, do you think that the Mariners are that type of team, or I guess they're filling some of those spots? Is there another team out there who would come in and blow that up and overpay Nelson Cruz? You just never know. I, I remember, I had never heard this until Thad Levine was on your show last week, and he said... Two years ago, when, when Pritz signed with Detroit, Texas offered him six years. And I had never seen that reported. We said it on your show. Detroit came in out of nowhere, signed him for nine. And I remember, you can look back, there were probably ten straight days of trot coffees talking about Prince Fielder to Texas and all the possibilities and what everybody was saying. And if it's not Texas, it's going to be this team or that team. Not one time were the Tigers mentioned in the press. And then they came in and gave him that landmark deal. So is there a team out there that could do that for Cruz? You know, maybe, but it's not going to be that type of deal because Cruz just, uh, he's four years older now. Well, he's 
six years older now than Prince was then, four years older now that we know of. Um, and he doesn't offer the upside that Prince Fielder does. You know, Prince at least can arguably still play defense. Um, Cruz, s some would say he was not able to play defense last year. Uh, I think at this point he's a DH. Um, and a good one, but you don't pay a DH the kind of money where you where someone comes in and just blows them away. There was a report, um, I'm sure a lot of you saw it, that Seattle had offered him five years and $75 million and he turned it down. There's no way it was offered, and there's no way he turned that down. Um, I, some, I'm sure it was his agent that planted that rumor just to get someone else to step up, but there's just no way he had that opportunity and then didn't take it. He would have pulled both hammies trying to get to that offer. <laughs> And say, yeah, I'm, I'll sign that. Oh, my God. Oh. Right. Patrick Claggett. I'm surprised that you have not brought up Tanaka yet because you are such a big Yu uh, Darvish supporter early on. Well, uh Well, he was asking about uh, Tanaka, and um, I think that was the Rangers' plan all along. I don't know about you. We haven't really talked about that very much. But I think when you look at their M.O., if they're going to overpay for somebody, they'd rather overpay for their years 25 through 30 as opposed to overpay for their years 30 through 36. And so Tanaka fits the profile in that regard, more so than him being a Japanese pitcher. It, it really doesn't have as much to do with that. If they scouted him and they really like Tanaka, then it makes sense to overpay for that because you know a certain the posting fee goes in a separate column. It doesn't affect their payroll the way they look at it. And it's a bargain. You're buying prime years. And I started digging around, and, and uh, over the last couple of years, when b through you Darvish, I ended up getting a source who's a really good source that uh, who is well placed in the Japan baseball culture, and uh, and so I've been asking a lot of questions. I was like, well, would would you Darvish be an asset in getting Tanaka if Tanaka was a free agent and could pick anywhere he wants to go? And I was told, if Tanaka is the type of guy who wants the spotlight, then he would never come to Texas. And I'm talking about the Japanese spotlight because he would have to share it with you, Darvish. So if his personality was the type to where he would see the advantage of having you, Darvish, be a mentor, a guy who's already gone through that and dealt with all the aggravation and the acclimation and those types of things, then Texas would be a front runner. So I started trying to find out, are these guys friends? What's their relationship like? And all I could get was that they've worked out together and they tease each other on Twitter and they're supposed to have some sort of a relationship. So I've been trying to get... Derek Holland to text you Darvish for us to find out <laughs> what is their relationship. So, so that's you, a really long way of saying you have no idea. So, so no, this is there's a couple there's a couple points. The first point is you Darvish will not respond to Derek Holland. How crazy is that? Yes, I would. So he's not responding to Derek, which I think is funny. But then I heard from someone tonight, obviously the posting rules are now official and it's $20 million and then free agency. And, um, you know, I just, I don't think he's going to be posted. I think they're going to say, hey, look, you're going to wait one year and then we'll do it next year. And if, I was told, if Tanaka was the type of guy who would fight that, like the type of personality is like, no, screw you, I'm going, uh, then maybe they would be forced to post him. But he's not that type of guy, so I I personally don't think Tanaka is going to get posted. I, I and I I'd heard I guess right before we started tonight that they I guess confirmed the new posting system, and I like it for Texas. I I like the fact that there's now a maximum posting bid, and everybody that puts in that maximum bid can bid can negotiate with the player. So it's almost like an American free agent, and you don't have to guess whether you need to throw in 60 or 70 million dollars to be the sealed bid that wins out those negotiating rights like with Darvish because if, if that were the case I don't think Texas is in the mood right now to put another 60 70 million dollars out there just to negotiate with the player but if it's only gonna be 20 um, and they feel like they're interested enough that they can negotiate with the guy use Darvish as an asset in the negotiation process if they think it is an asset which Ben has no idea then I, I like that because, I, you know, I, obviously the Rangers have established a presence in the Far East, and, I, you know, I, I think that they'd have as good a shot as any of negotiating with the player if they don't have to worry about being the top seal bid. Does anybody have any other uh, questions? Yeah, got one. Okay, so crazy hypothetical. If the Angels can steal one of our people for the rest of their career, would you rather them take Beltre or Don Welke?
They can have Don, but he's going to come right back after like a year. He's, there's, he would hate it out there. Um, although, if the Angels took Beltre for the rest of his, you know, his useful career, they're still not going to win. They are in so much of a shambles right now that even, even Beltre couldn't save them. And we'd still have Welke. You know, to that end, it's a front office question. By the way, if you got a couple more questions, anybody step up. But if, uh, you know, obviously A.J. Preller moved up to assistant general manager with Thad Levine, co-assistant GMs. If, what do you think it would take? What type of job would it take? And which one of those guys do you think would be first to leave, considering they're both going to be top-notch GM candidates and have been top-notch GM candidates? It, it all depends on the team because they are so different. The team that wants the guy out there that is the polished, contractual, creative, financial solution, communicator guy, Thad Levine is as good a candidate in the league as there is. A.J. Preller is the grunt on the backfields that is spotting Lexi Ogando throwing in the outfield and says, I think he's a pitcher. And he's doing that on the high school fields, and he's in Japan, and he's in Colombia, and he's in Cuba, and he's the scouting, you know, He's the scouting savant, and if that's what um, uh, an ownership group wants, then they want AJ. They're so different, which is what makes it such a brilliant combination here. That you know, with each of them feeding what they do to JD, it's that that triumvirate is just scary good. And it reminds me, um, for those of you who either are or used to be Cowboy fans, like I used to be, <laughs> if if you look back, to me, the genius of Jimmy Johnson was the staff he built. And you look at his coaching staff in those Super Bowl years and see not all of them went on to be very good head coaches, but a lot of them went on to be head coaches because they were so good at their jobs as assistant coaches. And right now, J.D. has a scary, great crew of advisors. And really, if you look in every role um, that a front office needs to have, they not only have a star in it, but they got a young guy behind them that could step right in if they get hired away. All right, so going back to the, uh, to the Japanese posting, with the uh, 20 million limit, I mean, what keeps teams from always going in 20 million every time there's a big free agent? You no, know? Nothing, and what that just creates is a free agency for the player, which is the idea that if he's, if he's the kind of player that has, you know, the level of ability that... 25 teams in the big leagues could find room for him. Theoretically, he should have the right to choose where he plays. It's for the lesser players that you have to decide, do I want to put in a $4 million bid or do I really want to stretch and go seven because he's a number five starter or a seventh inning guy or a Craig Gentry? That's where you have to get a little bit more creative with what you do. But the star players, they're just basically giving them free agency by saying yeah. anybody that wants to put that – $20 million down payment down that they get back if they don't get the player, yeah. they sort of just open it up. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Next up. Uh, I just wanted to ask to look into your crystal ball. Adrian Beltre was an unknown when he came. Sorry. Adrian Beltre, when he came here, was unknown when he, he was hurt and didn't always play up to his potential was paid a lot of money, and has been worth every dollar as far as I'm concerned. What do you see as far as his future? Because the hamstring history with him, third base, is there a DH future for him? I, I kind of think that, that toward the end of his contract, which goes through 2016 as long as he's healthy the year before that, he may end up being the team's DH that last year. And maybe once or twice a week you put him at third or maybe first just to get somebody else off the field and give them some DH at bats. They value so much about that guy that goes beyond what you see in the box score. That's what I'm talking about because he's, su he's been such a glue from the Latin end of it. And I think it goes beyond that. I don't think he's just a leader to the Latin American players. I think, that, I think he's... He crosses cultures, and he's just—he's a leader in that clubhouse. This is really his team. And in some ways, we say Elvis is the face of the team. I think that Adrian's the heart and soul of the team right now because the way he plays carries himself and expects that out of his teammates. And even if he starts to play less defense toward the end of this contract, 
it wouldn't shock me if they try to bring him back for another year in an option, as long as they think he can contribute something. Because right, having him in the dugout is that important. Uh, I want to tell a, a quick story about Adrian uh, Beltre. And the thought that he's just a leader with the Latin guys, you're right. That is inaccurate. Um, Robbie Ross told us a story on our show where, you know, I guess it's the uh, nobody is supposed to be later than the starting pitcher to the clubhouse each day. And so if somebody comes and they're later than the starting pitcher, that's a major no-no. The starting pitcher can, af can afford to be the last one there. And Robbie Ross was the last one there. And Beltre told him, hey, don't do that again. You got to be before the starting pitcher. Next time, you know, a couple weeks later, Robbie Ross is late after the starting pitcher. He says Adrian Beltre just gave him this look like, you son of a... And he's just like, wow, he's really mad. Don't know what to make of this. I guess I shouldn't be late. After the game, he gets to the clubhouse, and he's getting dressed, and he puts on his shirt, and he's like, Shh, and the sleeve, a long sleeve shirt only comes to his elbow. He's like, Shh. oh, somebody cut the sleeve off. He puts his pants on, and somebody had cut the leg off. And Adrian Beltre had gone to Robbie Ross's locker and just shredded his clothes. And he had no, uh, nothing else to wear. He had to wear his shredded clothes home. And Adrian Beltre just, he said, and he showed us the look. He said Adrian Beltre looked at him like this. He didn't it's say the anything. Walter White look, right? Yeah, the Walt White look, exactly. He just <laughs> stared laser beams through his soul. And to this day, Robbie Ross has never been late on a game day. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I think his leadership goes beyond just the Latin guys. Peter Elwood. Uh, I just wanted to ask, get your feeling. In Elvis's contract extension, he has an opt-out after four years. Do you think he'll take that opt-out? And do you think that impacts how the Rangers view him as a long-term asset? especially with regards to Profar and Rudy coming up? The only way he does not take that opt-out is if he plays 60 games that year going in because of injury and he knows he can't replicate the remainder of the contract on the open market. He'll opt out, um, but the thought is he opts out. Rangers hope they get first crack at tearing it up and just signing him to a new deal. So with Sabathia, A-Rod, sometimes that opt-out is created to give – um, all the leverage to the player where he's got that sec next four years or something if everything goes bad before that. Otherwise, he gets the chance to be a free agent again, which I think they, the Rangers expect to happen. They kind of hope happens because it mean he's, means he's played well until then. He's been healthy. But I assume that the, the idea will be that they'll re-sign him at that point or they'll trade him right before that opt-out year ends so they can get something back for him. Yes, sir. Aside from like big splashy names like Stanton and Carlos Gonzalez or Ryan Braun, do you see trade candidates for corner outfielders um, like possibly last year with Josh Willingham? Do you see anybody that's on that mid-level market that we could maybe acquire that wouldn't drain the farm system completely? I, I was kind of hoping that there'd be a little action on Alex Gordon at one point. Um, but I think Kansas City is in that mode now where they just they don't want to take any risk with their core guys because they really feel like they're the next Pirates. And right now they just want to add to that and not risk a switch of anybody that they have counted on. So I think that if it if that ever got broached, it ever went anywhere. But that was the kind of guy that I was thinking about, someone that was still in their prime, but maybe with a team that felt like they couldn't afford him when it comes time for free agency. Um, I haven't really given it much thought as to who else fits that description. There's no one left on the Twins that does. And they probably are two years away from thinking they're the next Pirates. Um, so I'd have to give us some thought as to what teams sort of fit that description. You know, the Astros don't have a guy. What's that? Kadir is 36 years old. I mean, you know, it's something like that. I mean, I, I would take Michael Kadir, but I wouldn't give up a whole lot. And I think he's too important to the Rockies as sort of their new face of the franchise now that Helton's gone. There's too low, of course. But Kadir is such a fixture there that – I don't think they're going to trade him unless it's a really good baseball move, and I just wouldn't be able to – I wouldn't offer enough to make it a great baseball move for them. You know, uh, one, one of my favorite sayings, and I can't, I can't remember who this was. Somebody wrote this in one of your books. Um, Thank God you're a fan of my team. Who, who, who? I think it was Skin. <laughs> skin. Somebody wrote that, Thank God you're a fan of my team, and I always feel that way about you. I mean, you could be a fan of any team, and you'd be doing this passion about it. Thank God you're a fan of my team. And uh, – and no doubt, give him a round of applause. And, you know, I, I'm just curious, what is it 
about the Rangers. Why is this your team? Why are you so loyal? Why are you so passionate? What is it that you love about Texas Rangers baseball? Uh, yes. Um, I mean, it's probably the same answer as anybody in here. I grew up with them. Um, I was probably – my family was a Dallas Cowboys family. When I was growing up, our weeks – revolved around where we were going to be Sunday and who was coming over or where we were going. And so I, the whole sports means almost everything was ingrained by the time I could, you know, pick up a bat or a football. Um, I gravitated to baseball maybe because that's the sport I played the most. And, um, but I don't know, there's some, there was something about being able to turn that radio on every night. And um, I'm about to write a report in the next few days where I probably am going to take a picture. I used to keep a scorebook when I was nine. I think I started when I was eight or nine, and I would draw the player of the game, and I still have the, those scorebooks. And um, I, my plan is to look to see, see if I have the game that was Eric Nadell's first. Be, that's, that's the theme of the report, because he started when I was nine, and if I have that report, I'm gonna show you whatever I drew, and it will be awful, but that's, I think that's where it started. Like baseball was just this magical thing in, in my life. It's, you know, it was always there for me and I, I always wanted to play and then that dream ended and then I thought maybe I'll be in a front office and then there was never any opportunity for that because you had to be a retired player to be in a front office back then. And so you know, I decided to write because I had nothing better to do and, and baseball was, it was, if I was gonna write about a sport, it was easy for me which one it was gonna be. I mean, but you're a great husband to Ginger, great father to Erica and Max, and uh, you're, you're a fantastic family man. And somehow that comes through in your writing, and I've always enjoyed that because it kind of encapsulates what's pure and greatness about America's greatest pastime. And what I mean, you could take the snark up to any level or whatever, but you choose to approach it as a family man. And, and I guess what's the thought process behind that? Is that just who you are? There is no question there that I can answer. So, I mean, thank you for saying those things, but um, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's like Peter and all his buddies that shut down and Tepid P, when we write, we just, we just write who we are. It's like you on the air, you're who, you're the same guy on the air that you are here that you probably are with Cat and your kids. And so it's- Way more sexual with Cat though. It's just way. <laughs> than I am with Cat? Cause well, I would- <laughs> Just kidding. <clears throat> no, I'm not. You know what I'm saying. Um, all right, man. Well, uh, thank you. My wife's like, yeah, right. Um, hey, I just want to say thank you for all you do, man. And um, it, I'm, I'm fascinated by how you do it. Um, I, I, don't, I don't get it. But I actually have talked to people at your law firm. I know you are a hell of an attorney as well. Um, they're not, it's, they don't treat him like, that guy that's always writing about baseball. I don't think a lot of them even know. Um, so you managed to do both things exceedingly well. Uh, but I think to summarize the way we all feel, thank you for being a fan of the Texas Rangers.